Uh, thank you all actually for being with me here at the end of the day. <laughs> I know we're all eager to go get dinner and probably go to the uh, go to the after party. Um, I'm Daniel Schiffsmith, Digital Technology Manager at Amnesty International USA. I'm going to talk to you today about uh, generally about how we did the website redesign of AmnestyUSA.org uh, about almost a year ago, and how we used uh, design patterns, really design systems, and uh, advanced custom fields. Do pretty much anything we want to be able to do. Um, I'm not going to go through my whole thing here, but that's everything about me for right now that you probably need to know. Um, the biggest thing is just understand that I've worked on about 50 websites for Drupal, um, definitely over 100 different WordPress sites uh, that were either just general WordPress sites or also like WordPress site flat app kind of websites as well. Um, so I've done around the block and I've done a few things. Um, and I'm on the process of dating myself because I've been doing this for almost 20 years now, which is kind of nice. Uh, so, I came out to Amnesty International USA in May of 2016. Um, when I came on, uh, one of my first tasks was actually to do website design. To look at what we were doing, look at uh, how we were performing, and figure out how we could kind of optimize it and make it even better. This is the comment that I kept hearing over and over and over again, or something like that, which was that our website looked so 2009, here is what it looked like. So it fit right inside that nice little, what was that, 960 pixel kind of area there. Um, it wasn't responsive at all. So if you looked at it on your mobile phone, you had to do that. Just kind of make it bigger to be able to see everything and click on things. Um, we also had a really tough time kind of getting your focus on what we wanted you to, to do. You can tell that at one time, someone probably said make the logo bigger up in the top left there. And so we made it, you know, really kind of a much larger than it normally probably should be. Um, so when I came on, you know, one of the things, first things I did was made it responsive, you know, just the website we had. But I started looking at other Amnesty properties throughout the world. Um, the way Amnesty works is we have different sections across the world. We operate in different countries, and so each country pretty much runs autonomously. Um, we have our own websites, our own, for the most part, our own branding, our own marketing materials, things like that. But we all share one common goal, and we also answer to one International Secretariat, it's called, which is basically our, our headquarters, our, our folks that give us uh, kind of the orders and what we need to be doing moving forward. This is the uh, main amnesty.org website. Uh, it was uh, done, I believe, in 2015, maybe 2014. Um, but it's kind of the direction we wanted to start going. We wanted to start doing a much more modern look. We wanted to get away from having so much yellow on the page. You'll notice the only yellows you're really going to see here are the logo and maybe like a primary button of sorts. Uh, and we also wanted to focus on really kind of, you know, using a totally different design aesthetic of trying to use more white space to really focus your eye on specific pieces um, of what we were trying to achieve. Here's another example. This was uh, Amnesty uh, Australia's website. Um, actually done in WordPress, which is pretty cool. Uh, I think they might have been the first Amnesty section to do a site in WordPress, which is pretty awesome. Um, but theirs launched uh, just a few months after I got uh, to Amnesty. Um, but their, their whole trajectory on how long it took them was about, I think, of like a year and a couple months or something. So it was a big endeavor. And I basically had somewhere around about uh, six to eight months to really get something up ramping and going and get it to where I wanted it to be. So where do I start? Where do I begin? So the first thing I wanted to do was start with research. I wanted us to really look at you know what's working, what's not working, what literally is just crashing and not doing well at all. Um, but I also wanted to find a design studio that would help us do these things. A design studio that maybe had done similar types of projects like this, work with similar organizations, uh, kind of of our caliber and what we try to do. And so I found this great shop called HyperAct. Um, they're a social impact design studio based out of Brooklyn, New York. Um, just so happens our national headquarters are in New York City, so this wasn't a, a, a far fetch for me to actually meet them in person if I had to and things like that. But also, um, their ethos was just terrific. Um, They're really, really good at design, really heavily involved in the design community, the DIGA, and things like that. Uh, and they were founded by two refugees. I don't think you can get a better story for us on, on a design firm to work with. Um, D. Roy on the left uh, was from Cuba, uh, and Julia on the right was from the Ukraine. And um, 
you know, I don't want to get, get stuck on that, that, that we chose them for that reason, but we chose them because they're really good at design and looking at, at, um, at human rights organizations like ours and transforming them into where they needed to be rather than what you saw before on that website, which was just a whole lot of fluff with a lot of yellow going on. That's a lot of yellow too. <laughs> so we wanted to really do this right. We didn't want to fixate on just, you know, two or three different methods of discovery. We wanted to do a good array of things where we could get a lot of input from a lot of different types of people. Um, so we actually attended different amnesty conferences. We have these regional conferences every year. We also have what's called an annual general meeting, which is essentially like all the amnesty folks from the United States getting together once a year. We told them what we were doing. We had a little workshops with them as well. Uh, we had several different stakeholder workshops, um, both in New York City and in Washington, D.C. Uh, we did group interviews, online surveys, we did uh, actual member leader phone calls where we would talk to like some of our, our uh, uh, most involved volunteers and hear from them on what their concerns were and what they needed and things like that. We did one-on-one -on -one interviews um, internally and externally and also with people who had never heard of amnesty. Who, you know, when we showed them our candle uh, uh, icon, had no idea what it was, which is perfectly fine. That we wanted to know, you know, how we could attract folks like that too. And we did some of the more traditional things, you know, that we're used to in the web world: analytics, heat mapping, search engine making, and stuff like that. Um, our our workshops look like this. So we did things like card sorting, we did things like content mapping, um, really trying to think about all the different pieces that that folks would want coming to the actual website. And it was made up of a mix of staff, member leaders, um, again, folks that may not have heard too much about us, you know, who, who we found just through different research groups and stuff like that. Uh, we also uh, went through with our analytics a bit, and did some really deep diving on kind of figuring out what worked, what didn't work. Uh, we got about a million, yeah, about a million page views a month at that time. Um, but the thing that was really surprising me to me. Actually, can anyone see what's so surprising there in all that data? Let's see the one thing. Yeah. This is insane. I've never seen a site with 15% bounce rate. That basically means that most people who are coming to our website, and according to our data, we're staying on there for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, stuff like that, um, which, were, which were skewing all the data from everyone else. So when we saw something like that, Yes, that looks awesome and amazing, and it looks like very cool, like we're in a good position here. But the reality, too, is how is that possible? <laughs> you know, we have a lot of content, but we know that people are having a difficult time getting to it from different devices. We know people are having a difficult time finding that content on our website. So that, to us, was a little suspicious, and actually it was suspicious for a reason. We found out later. Um, we also did heat mapping like this, so it was just running on our site uh, continuously. And what it was looking at was uh, clicks and also um, hover states. So as people are kind of you know mousing over things or clicking on things, we're looking at what the what they're most interested in and what they're doing. Um, the biggest ones, of course, uh, were the search, which is telling us they can't find the things in the navigation that they want to be able to find. Um, our work, which is like you know our main areas of focus, what we do, why we do what we do. And by the way, we're a human rights organization. If you don't know that. <laughs> um, and then the other big one, you'll see at the bottom there, it's actually about us and careers. <laughs> so the other two big things people kept kind of poking on. Um, donate had some clicks up there. Um, we do make a lot of donations online, but we noticed that folks just weren't necessarily going right to that when they came to the website. Uh, we also use uh, Hotjar. We use Hotjar for the heat map in there. Hotjar is a great uh, web application that you should check out. Um, I think they have a free version, I'm pretty sure, but if you just pay a little bit extra money, they actually have these really great tools that you can use. Um, this one for us was really a, a great uh, opportunity. There's this thing called incoming feedback. Um, and AJ Morris actually talked about this a little bit uh, a couple sessions ago today. Where basically on our website, all someone uh, had to do was, was go ahead and put in their um, comment right on the site, all we have is a little smiley face that shows up. So if you go to the site right now, you're going to see a little smiley face in the bottom right corner. <laughs> and if you put a message in there, it's actually going to go to my team. So just so you know. Uh, but the great thing about this was it showed us not just what people were saying, but also showed us how they were reacting to the site, what they liked, what they didn't like. And you know, our goal was basically to move it so that we're getting mostly green, their, their hearts in there, green heart faces, rather than getting the angry red face ones. 
We also did an online survey, uh, and that survey, you know, we tried to make it as simple as possible. This is literally just a WordPress site um, spun up with uh, some, uh, was it gravity forms? <laughs> Uh, and we just did this as a quick thing in Pantheon, like a personal level or something, and that's it. You know, just spun it up, got the data we needed to, uh, sent this out with our email folks um, to get people to actually fill out the information. Uh, and what was great was we didn't give them 50 questions to do. We gave them three questions on two pages. That was it. That's all we wanted to know. What did you like? What do you dislike? And what do you wish? That's it. Because everything else from that was actually taking people away from actually filling out the form. They weren't feel like they weren't completing it, or they just weren't interested in it. We were getting much higher bounce rates, and we had a lot more questions on it. So, with all of that research and all that information discovery, we realized we needed to have a design system in place. And this is something I had kind of um, was also in my gut that I wanted to have this for us. I wanted to have kind of a some type of way that we could be able to make well make our designs work better across the across our microsites and our websites. So the main reasons we had for actually implementing a design system, the first one was we wanted to support the brand. So we make a lot of microsites throughout the year. Uh, I just rolled one out actually like two days ago um, that we made in a week <laughs> on WordPress. We design and custom theme and stuff like that. We'll make about 12 to 15 for the year. So it's about one and a half every month basically. But with those microsites, we wanted to be able to also take the same types of design elements that we use on the main website and use it on those. So that we're not kind of reinventing the wheel, we're having um, a, really a quicker time to be able to, to go from ideation to actual production of what we want to have out there. Um, the other big thing about the team by supporting the brand is we have this global brand that we work with. We all have common pieces in our brand. I'll show you that in a second as well. And so we need to kind of adhere to that. We need to make sure that we're using the right fonts, the right icons, and things of that nature. And then uh, the second part is that it's naturally agile. Uh, so what's interesting about design systems is that uh, we can actually create a new iteration of a design very quickly. So we can create you know, four or five different page designs in a matter of minutes just by moving content around and saving them as different drafts and then sharing them across the organization to whoever uh, needs to approve those. And then the last one is ease of use. Uh, so for us, having a design system actually made it easier for both the viewer, so the person coming to the website to get kind of a regular common understanding of our visual language, uh, but also made it easier for the person who's administrating the WordPress. Um, the thing I'll show you in our, our code and our backend is we don't allow people to actually add in specific images just anywhere into the website. There's really specific places in there where you can add an image. Otherwise, you have to kind of adhere to the system that we put together. So the most famous uh, kind of design system out there that we had known about was Atomic Design. How many people have heard of Atomic Design? Okay. It's, um, it came out, I think about maybe three years ago now. Uh, Brad Frost, uh, who's a web designer, uh, had thought about this concept that basically Breaking down content into smaller chunks so that we could focus on designing them in the pieces that made the most sense and then kind of mixing and remixing those as needed to come up with really interesting different types of visual ways to show your content. Um, so it looks more like this. The practicality is like this. So if you were doing a mobile application, you're going to break it down to you know, creating the icons, to creating what text might look like, to creating what images might look like. These are just placeholders. They go a little bit further with that. You know, deciding kind of what are these pieces of content that would go together and how they'd be uh, uh, positioned. Then looking at uh, even more pieces together, kind of like your core uh, organisms, basically. And then these templates, and then the final thing is the actual design of pages. We love that. It looks great, and it's pretty awesome. But you know what? Internally, for us to tell someone, what do you think of this organism? No one got it, no one wanted to kind of go that way. So we had to kind of adapt it to our own, uh, our own language and kind of break it down a little bit easier for everyone to kind of understand. And I'll get back, I'll get back to that a little bit. Um, the other thing that molded with that, so now that we need, you know, we're looking at atomic design a little bit on how we do the design system, the other element for us was that Bootstrap 4 was just coming out of beta, basically, or just coming into beta. 
Um, how many people have worked with Bootstrap before? before? Okay. So Bootstrap 4 is a framework of CSS, HTML, and JavaScript. Uh, and if you are a hardcore developer, you probably hate it. <laughs> That's the reality. But the truth is, for us, because we're on limited budgets, we work with a lot of different developers, we're doing a lot of different applications and things like that, we need to have one common core system to work with, one framework that we could then duplicate, iterate upon, um, and keep reusing, and also contributing to like one core system across all these different platforms with all kinds of vendors. So for us, Bootstrap 4 actually looked uh, very forward thinking and made a lot of sense. So that's what uh, we decided to move forward with. So, designing the system. So we realized that, you know, uh, starting out, we really have to look at our global brand and look at kind of what we had available to us and what we had to adhere to. And so for us, it was focusing on this thing called the Big Yellow Book. It sounds like an 80s hacker term, that's why I love it. <laughs> uh, but the Big Yellow Book, basically at Amnesty, allows us to see all the branding guidelines of um, that all of our sections are supposed to follow. So this is the content of that. I just pulled out a few things that make the most sense for us to take a look at. Um, so this is it as an example of how a logo should be used, uh, what kind of variations of the logo could be done. Um, the next one being the language variations, uh, what it looks like with our country identifier on it. And if you look at our website, you'll notice we have that on there as well. Uh, and then what, you know, logo placement based on different um, digital pieces, so website or mobile app, um, what it like social media, and so on. So you get the picture, though. Right? They gave us a really good kind of framework to start with. They gave us the good guidelines, like what we kind of you know, wanted to focus on, and what we had to kind of uh, stick with in. These nice constraints to me were actually helpful, not a hindrance um, to start with. One of the other great things about this, too, is it told us exactly what colors were uh, in play, you know, what colors made sense. Um, and for us to basically stay away from anything else. Uh, the, some of the things it gave us too was uh, specific fonts to use. We have a, our own unique font called Amnesty Trade Gothic. That's what this is here, and uh, we convert it into a web font so we can use it on there as well. And our secondary typeface is Arial, which I was like, no. <laughs> um, so you probably won't see much Arial on our site at all. It was also good because it gave us some uh, focus on what iconography we needed to use, uh, and also told us kind of what the photography should be like, and how we should be working with it, um, and what it actually should essentially represent. So what the visuals should be of any photographic elements that we use across the website. So with that, um, you know, with that there, and also going back and looking at the websites from the other sections, we started to kind of put together an idea of what this content would be. Um, and for us, what we call them were four modules. Um, our current site at that time is on Drupal 6. <laughs> so we are already using things like modules on there, but don't let that confuse you. For us, modules were really just a chunk of content that should kind of be together. And we figured in our heads that we could move these modules around on a page and make different types of page designs from them. And so these are just wireframes uh, that hyperactive, uh, putting together this you know, little experimentation on what these modules might look like. Um, here's another one kind of showing like how to put images on a page that might link to other places, like on a landing page or something like that. And then this is actually an end result. So that first module we just saw, which is right here, actually converted into this, into us using the, the true uh, typography that we're supposed to use, the great iconography as well, um, and showing what the data looks like when we're actually portraying it. So, same thing with this one too. So when we're showing images in a certain place and we just want to have the title, um, it's giving us that ability to do that um, right there. So once we kind of had a whole bunch of those figured out, um, I'll actually show you the example of those. Okay. So they have all different kinds of We had all different kinds of modules, basically, that were put together. Um, some of these like navigation elements. Um, this is like a variation of a navigation element that I might use somewhere. And stuff like that. Uh, go over to our work. These 
and other pieces of modules that we kind of have inside of there as well. So we really planned out kind of all these different uh, concepts of what these modules might look like, the different uh, ways we might use them, and things like that. Um, once we had those modules in place, then we started thinking about those larger pieces of content that would go together, and actual whole pages, what those might look like. And so we had HyperX actually planning out specific uh, wireframe mockups that would show us a little bit of, you know, if we were mixing these content pieces around, what they would look like, and what they would be. And so for us, on the back end of what we were doing, we were labeling everything as well. So we knew that, you know, this example right here was banner one, the navigation up there is navigation 1A. Um, and then the last part to that was for us to kind of marry that with the actual design concepts that they had. So we did all of the concepts of, you know, these page layouts and everything, all you know, these, these wireframe layouts, um, as wireframes, sorry. Um, but then, for this part, we actually just went ahead and coded that. We didn't go through and do tons of mockups every time for all different pages. We just made actual coded pieces of those uh, to move forward. Uh, this is what the actual design looked like there a bit. And this is all inside of Sketch. Um, for those of you familiar. So here's like variations of the navigation, uh, variations of banners. And so for us, you know, getting these and being able to work with these uh, made it a lot easier for us to think in modular terms, to think in terms of how can we take this, place it on a page, make it easier for someone to be able to create these different page designs um, using something like advanced custom fields. So the next part that we had to look at was how do we build this system? You know, how do we actually do it? Um, and I'll admit, we didn't actually know at first. We just went with it and figured out that we would build the bridge, and then we would figure out once we got over there, you know, how many of the seal everything up and make it, make it stay up. So we looked at different things. We looked at a lot of different um, uh, static generator, uh, gener generator sites, uh, Billman, Steps, the Tandemic, Jekyll. Um, but we also looked at, you know, do we want to upgrade Drupal 6 to Drupal 8? Or do we want to move to WordPress? And ultimately for us, it was move to WordPress. Um, the biggest reasons for us um, were really the faith in the maintenance that we knew that we could easily click a button to a plugin or a core, update it, and we wouldn't have, I wouldn't say we wouldn't have any issues, but we won't have, we won't have issues most of the time. I know for some time there's no issues to be had. Um, the second thing for us was it was easier development. Um, honestly, goodness, there's just a lot more uh, text of plugins we could work with, there's a lot more different developers we could work with, there's a lot more information if something went wrong on, online. Um, for us to work with. And the last part for us was a robust community. Um, you know, anytime we had an, had an issue with WordPress in the past, with other types of projects or whatever, you ask a question online, you go to a WordCamp like this, and you can get people to actually answer you and get that information, which is really great. For us, we also chose Pantheon to, to put our website on. Um, the biggest reason, and if you hadn't seen Pantheon yet, the biggest reason was um, their hosting environment uh, has a, a uh, dev version, a test version, and a live version. And you can seamlessly push your database and your files and your code in between all those versions. And so the code I'm actually going to show you um, today and the example I'm going to show you are all running on our test version right now. I wasn't going to do it on live, <laughs> so we're on test. Um, but I just spun that up literally in the next room uh, just in a few minutes um, right before this presentation. So it just makes it very quick for us to be able to, to make changes, to iterate on things, uh, and to work with them. Uh, the, the DNS part to it, what we're using in our caching is all Cloudflare, just you know, the back end part. Um, and also, too, if there's anyone who uh, is a nonprofit in here, I'm also on this board called Project Galileo at Cloudflare. Uh, we offer free Cloudflare like business um, licenses for, for nonprofits. Um, and then the other thing we focused on realizing we wanted to do in a backend system was we wanted to put it on uh, a theme, a starter theme that made the most sense as far as being forward thinking. For us, it was Sage, um, which used to be called Roots. Um, Sage uh, was already doing some experimentation even at that time with Webpack and some other stuff. Um, we're still on the older version, so we're using Gulp and Bower and Bootstrap and all these little like doohickeys basically. If you don't know what those are, don't worry about it. The whole premise of it is it just makes our development that much quicker. We don't have to worry about all the nitty-gritty pieces of compiling things and making them run fast and making them 
um, the scenario look great, we just have to worry with us putting in our code and going from there. So with all that said, the first part we started at, um, and I know this is going fast, but was actually putting together uh, just an HTML, CSS, JavaScript style guide um, built off of the bootstrap elements. And so this is us literally taking over all bootstrap frameworks of um, mental pieces. So we're, you know, we're, we're, <laughs> we're uh, reskinning their buttons, their mastheads, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, we can add things like Google Maps. That's a real Google Map running there um, that we use throughout. But the concept was that all of these pieces, um, like this one, for example, module one, all these pieces would then be available for us inside of the back end of WordPress. So when you edited a web page, you could choose module one. That's one element that you want to throw into there. You could choose, do you want the image on the left or the right? Uh, and you can choose what the title's going to be. Is it our history or about us or whatever? Um, and that's where we were really going with this, was to make it so that we could use a style guide like that, um, start with just the code part, and then go from there. What's that? Okay. Um, we looked at things that Visual Composer do. That didn't make sense to us. Uh, but then I saw this article from Web Designer Magazine that actually made a ton of sense. And they actually talked about using advanced custom fields with WordPress to make these unique kind of layouts. Um, and they walked you through the whole thing. Um, it's still up there. It's actually the, uh, what was it, the April 2016 um, one, which was, I guess, out in February of last year or so, so it's a few months ahead. Uh, and ultimately, we decided to go with ACF. Um, for us, the biggest thing was the use of these two things, flexible content and the repeater fields, and being able to use those over and over again to be able to make things happen. So good, to the coding examples part. So let me show you exactly how we kind of put those things together. So in advanced custom fields, this is what it looks like if you make a, a group. Um, in that group, you'll notice we only have one field here. It's called a flexible content field. I'm going to zoom in just a little bit so you can see it. Flexible content field. Inside of that field, that's where you'll see all of our different repeater fields that kind of take over. So the first one you'll see is heading text. Um, this here is actually just long as to choose a different type of header that the user might want on there. The next one you might see is body text. And the body text will often decide what signs they want their body text to actually be in there. And it goes through and actually just adds in other types of modules like that. Buttons, horizontal line. Uh, we even put, anyone use Facet WP? All right, we even put Facet WP in there so we can put a search basically and with multiple multi-faceted search on any page you want to as well. Uh, and then if we go down, we have even more modules that are in there. This is module, the first module we were just looking at there. And these are all the pieces to that module that we can allow someone to override. So in the case of a page like this, this is the About Us page. Uh, when someone comes in here and they want to be able to edit it, um, all they have to do is click on that edit page there, open it up, and it looks something like this. So we scroll down. This is the body text part. So for them, that's this piece right here. And they can decide what size that should be. This person made that one to be body one because it's the first piece that's going to be on there. But they could add it and change it to anything else they want to inside of there. They also could change the actual margins at the top of the bottom if they wanted to. Or they could add padding to it if there was like a background color on this or something like that. Uh, this is the second body text piece we saw there. This is right here. And usually when someone's editing this, by the way, um, when someone's editing this, usually we have these toggled to be closed. It's just easier to look at. So like, you can just scan real quickly. You can see, oh, there's the two body text elements. Now here's the module one that I have to work with. And so the module one looks like this. So we're able to add an image. We're able to decide how they want to align that image, left to right. Uh, then they have the title. We have the body. Uh, and again, that all goes back to groups that we have over here, the fields. So there's that title, there's that body, there's that aligned image. These are just normal um, advanced custom fields that we put in there, like there's the image type, there's the radio button, there's the text field. Uh, and it all comes down to this. So this is the image on the left, there's that title, and there's that body. It all seemed, you know, when I was putting this together, when I kept reading about it, 
It all seemed very complex for us to do. It seemed really difficult. But once we actually got the concept and broke it down, it's, it's really, really just ill if statements at the end of the day. So this is the back end part to it in the actual uh, site. But the code looks like this. So for us, this is, a, this is a, just a page template, basically. But all it's looking for is it's looking to see if we have any rows that are module content, that's that uh, flexible field that we put in there. And if we have a module content of one, then we put in all that information, basically, from the custom fields. Um, what you'll notice is there's nothing crazy in here except for those if statements. This is all, you know, if you're working with advanced custom fields and putting custom fields in there, this is normal stuff you've already worked with, you know, things like adding an image, or things like adding a subfield on a repeater field, and stuff like that. So at the end of the day, for us, what we started realizing was, wow, we could really take this even further and do even more with it. So we've been rolling this out with microsites and all kinds of stuff like that, and actually building a, just kind of an internal structure for us to keep going with that. So for us, now, our future for this is that we're also using a similar approach to how we do the mobile application. Um, we're building that Ionic framework um, with GraphQL, um, but we're using GraphQL basically a little bit of how we work with some fields and stuff like that to decide what we want on these Ionic pages, which is great. Um, we're also building a public facing style guide, which should be done in about uh, the middle of February. And the next thing for end of December 2018 is a desktop application. With similar methods, but using Electron for that type of situation. Ah, that's it. Try to cram it all in. You got it all in. <laughs> Any questions for speaker? So, um, in default WordPress search doesn't use doesn't search post meta. So, are you doing some kind of stuff for the searching? Yeah, we're using search WP. Okay. Um, so that was just the easiest way around that. Yeah. Any other questions? Any plans to move this all into Gutenberg? Oh, that's actually, yeah, I didn't want to mention that, but that was our next thing was to think about doing those Gutenberg blocks. Um, yeah, we already started kind of looking at that and seeing with that. We got uh, Zach Gordon's uh, videos to kind of go over and do that. Yeah. Open for the April launch. So, so, yeah. Let's yeah. push back. So, <laughs> now it's actually a question about the April. So does that mean, and I've only very briefly looked at Gutenberg, does that mean Gutenberg's going to play nicely with advanced custom fields? Uh, um, and yes. how much will, uh, what, what is, because um, um, you know where I work, we use ATF quite heavily in the yeah. development side. So that's going to have a large impact. So planning for the future, how much is that going to play? Yeah, uh, same with us. And, um, you know, in all the work I've done previous to Amos, we've always used advanced custom um, and even on the programmatic side, I didn't get into that, but we rarely actually do our fields uh, in the editor on the back end. We're actually committing them to Git, so that's yes. how you know, we're doing all that stuff. Um, but uh, from what I've heard from the on back team, yes, I mean, sh things should play well. Elliot from ACF knows about what's going on, so. Okay. As far as I know, it'll be okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Having gone through all this, do you have anything different? Um, giving us more, more runway. It's a quick, quick time frame to get everything done. I think we probably would have given ourselves like two or three more months. And a question. Let's thank our speaker one more time. And a quick reminder: the party starts in 45 minutes at the Hispanic Cultural Center.